Apocalypse has come to Skyrim. The dragons and their undead minions are taking over, decimating the population, and leaving every city in ruin. We are one of the only survivors. But time is running short for Skyrim. After 50 days have passed, Alduin will descend and devour the world forever. But we have a chance to stop him. If we can kill the bosses who now rule all nine holds of Skyrim before the 50 days are up, we can draw Alduin into a deathmatch and slay him before he can finish enacting his apocalyptic plan. If we die during the run, we respawn at the last place we slept and lose 24 hours, bringing us an entire day closer to Doomsday. Our mission to stop the dragon apocalypse starts now. Apocalyptic Skyrim is made possible by the fantastic Shattered Skyrim world overhaul, previously called Alternate Skyrim, and add-ons created by enthusiastic modders. For more information on the mods used during this playthrough, see the video description below. Last time we played Apocalyptic Skyrim, we played as a Nord named Survivor. Let's switch things up and try High Elf this time, the opposite of a Nord if ever there was one. Right off the bat, we encounter one of the main new features added to this playthrough. A mysterious woman meets us at the exit of the cave and lets us choose a starting class for our character. What class we select here will affect what gear we start with and what powerful loot we'll find during our journey. We have seven options, each aligning with a different fighting style. Since High Elves are naturally skilled at magic, we choose the Sorcerer class. We exit out onto Angie's camp in the southern Falkreath Mountains. This Khajiit explains that the dragons are taking over Skyrim, and that there's a dragon priest leading the enemy forces in Falkreath, which is the first city we'll be taking back from the undead. Then, we loot the camp to get our starting equipment, including a woodcutter's axe, several lockpicks, and a few food and alchemy items. But the most important thing we find is this sorcerer's chest. This chest will contain an assortment of items geared towards the class we chose. So, for Sorcerer, magic tomes, staffs, robes, etc. But the specific items we get are randomized. We'll be receiving one of these chests for each hold capital, and the spell books we find within will play a huge part in determining how we build our character going forward. Let's hope this chest is a good one! Okay, so we have quite a bit of variety here. The robes, okay, that's good. Um, the potions? I mean, I guess these are useful. Let's, okay. The uh, rings, spell tomes, I'll need to sort through these. Okay, let's go ahead and take everything, but it looks like we have some pretty good grabs in here. So we got two pieces of jewelry with minor enchantments that will help our spellcasting, and a set of basic enchanted robes, which are still a pretty big get. Trying to play a mage without a good set of robes can be rough. In terms of spells, our alteration pickups were pretty lucky. We already got the first three levels of armor spells to better protect us from physical damage. However, we got very little in terms of offense. No higher level destruction spells, and only the bound sword spell from Conjuration. Time to begin our long journey to take back Skyrim from the minions of Alduin. We head down the mountain towards Falkreath Hold. In my last apocalyptic survival video, I covered Falkreath in detail, so this time we'll focus on the highlights. Our immediate goals are pretty straightforward. We're playing survival mode, so we want to collect meat from wild game and find a base where we'll be able to sleep. We'll also be collecting animal pelts so that we can craft a backpack at a tanning rack, which will increase our carrying capacity. One of our first stops is the ruined house of Pine Watch. Pine Watch has a garden of alchemical herbs and crops that are ripe for harvesting. We then find ourselves attacked by a roaming skeleton, the first of many we'll be seeing here in Falkreath. Looks like it's already injured from a fight with some animal, so it goes down easily. I know a great shelter in the area, but on the way north, we have a run-in with a pack of wolves. Our flame spell makes fairly quick work of them. We swim across the lake to the sunken fortress of Illinalta's Deep, just the shelter I was looking for. This fort was a necromancer lair in the base game, but is now occupied only by a few measly skeletons. There's a pair of beds here, and we use the alchemy table to make a bunch of magicka potions. Alchemy will prove to be a key skill throughout our playthrough. We rest here, marking our first day gone. 49 days remain. In the early hours of morning, we swim over to the Guardian Stones where we can 
can obtain the sign of the mage. This will help us learn our magic skills more quickly. At Half Moon Mill, we find a bunch of raw meat in the shed out back. Ignoring the suspicious bloody humanoid bones also lying about, we happily stash the meat into our pack for cooking later. We then venture southwest to Cracked Tusk Keep, an awesome base of operations with food and pelt stores, a forge, and an alchemy table. We use the tanning rack here to turn leather from animal pelts into a backpack, giving us a much needed boost to our carrying capacity. At the alchemy table, we can brew up some more potions and poisons. Since all the merchants from the base game have fallen prey to the dragons, we'll be relying on our own crafting skills in this playthrough, and we'll need to make use of Skyrim's natural resources. We also make a campfire using branches gathered in the area, so that we can cook the meat we gathered earlier. We can rest well tonight at the keep, now with a full belly. The next day, we try to venture out again, but a patrol group of about a dozen skeletons finds us. Time for some firepower. The skeletons with melee weapons don't pose much of a threat to us, and we can stay out of range pretty easily while hurling flames at them. It's the archers we need to worry about, and unfortunately, there are quite a few of them. After taking out the melee fighters, we retreat into the woods to get some cover from the archers, but we're outnumbered, and their aim is surprisingly good for skeletons. Okay, so there are four archers, it seems. Um, we can just creep up behind the trees. We just need to take them out, like, like one at a time. Shh. Okay, potion. <laughs> How is my health so low? Okay. No! No! All right, well, that's a death. We respawn by the bed we slept at in Cracked Tusk Keep, but it's now 24 hours later. We also kept accumulating hunger and fatigue during that time, so we're now exhausted, hungry, and uncertain whether our base is about to get raided by undead. Luckily, there's a second exit up to the keep's rooftop that we can use to scout out the exterior. We learn that the four skeletons who downed us are still lurking outside. We grab their attention, which lures them up through the keep to the rooftop, where we incinerate them one by one as they emerge through the trap door. We're still exhausted, but it doesn't feel safe to rest in a fort that we know has been compromised, so we head out into the Falkreath Forest to find a safer shelter. That ends up being Illinalta's Deep again, where we can disenchant some unneeded gear for experience, then get some much needed bed rest. But the clock is ticking. If we're going to clear every hold within 50 days, we need to get a move on, so we return to Falkreath with a vengeance, ready to start taking down the undead. We start by picking off Draugr, who are alone on the outside skirts, but our bow breaks almost immediately. Fortunately, we have another, and can scavenge more from fallen Draugr archers. Heading around to the western gate of Falkreath, we continue pelting Draugr with arrows to thin out their numbers. We soon draw out Sidgir, former Jarl of Falkreath, now turned dragon priest and commander of the Falkreath undead. Sidgir engulfs us in fire with his staff of flames, but we can outsustain his damage by making heavy use of our healing spell. In our other hand, we we finally get some use out of our bound sword spell, closing in to melee range. Through repeated hacking, slashing, and healing, we finally strike down Sidgear with a decisive blow, meaning we've conquered the first boss of the run, but Falkreath is still in turmoil. As the light grows dim, we sweep across town, incinerating the remaining Draugr. In the ruins of Jarl Sidgear's longhouse, we find it. Our next sorcerer's chest. The game is about to get much more difficult as we head to Whiterun Hold. Let's hope there's something in here that'll help us kill a dragon. All right, chest number two, here we go. Uh, all right, soul gems, sure, potion, sure. Contra familiar is probably not great. Uh, frostrune, okay, that's that's something. Staff of the Flame Atronach, okay. That's interesting. That is something we definitely can use. We return to Illinalta's Deep, a hard day's work accomplished. That's one hold down, eight to go. Let's take a quick look at our stats after clearing Falkreath. We're now level nine with two perk points in alchemy, one that makes all our concoctions stronger, and one that specifically makes stat restoring potions stronger. We've put a couple points towards restoration and three points into alteration, including the first point of mage armor, which makes our armor spells much more effective when we're only wearing clothes and jewelry. I haven't put any points into destruction yet, because I don't know if we'll get powerful destruction spells moving forward. So for now, our defenses are strong, but we're lacking in damage. With 45 days remaining, we cross over the mountains into Whiterun, and already spot a dragon flying a patrol route. If it spots us, it can alert the Draugr to our location. We hurry down the other side, hoping it doesn't notice us. The first thing we do, after checking that the coast is clear, is to dash across the tundra to the abandoned Fort Greymoor. This will be our starting base of operations as we explore Whiterun 
on hold. Fort Greymore has something we haven't had access to yet, a cooking pot, which will let us make more complex food recipes than we can when cooking at a basic campfire. The base also comes with a handy-dandy secret tunnel that we can use to sneak out the back to avoid detection by enemies, who may be watching the front entrance. Because we didn't get any upgraded destruction spells, our main objective right now is finding something that will give us enough firepower to kill a dragon. To do this, we embark on a quest to loot some of the many bandit camps scattered around Whiterun Hold, but we'll need to avoid the patrolling dragon while we do so. First, we check the Silent Moon's bandit camp, which is now abandoned because, well, the bandits are all dead. We loot some foodstuffs, but don't find any dragon-slaying secret weapons. At Halted Stream Camp, we have our first encounter with the local undead, which are higher-level Restless Draugr. These guys are way harder to take down than the skeletons we were dealing with before. We stop by Shimmer Mist Cave, but clear out when we realize the Falmer have survived the apocalypse and are still very deadly. Around nightfall, we stop at Valtime Towers, which is outdoors, so it's not the best shelter, but it does have a bed where we can sleep. It also has an alchemy lab, which is always a big plus. But the next day is when we finally stumble across our secret weapon. We kill a hostile necromancer and find the Ritual Stone. One of the mods I'm using in this challenge is called Evenstar, and it replaces the vanilla standing stone buffs with simple but powerful alternatives. With this mod, the Ritual Stone lets us conjure an additional minion. Although we don't know any good summoning spells right now, we did just pick up that Staff of Flame Atronach summoning from the Falkreath Sorcerer chest. We could combine it with this buff to get two Atronachs at once. We make our next shelter at White River Watch, which gives us a good vantage point to watch for the dragon. And oh, does it arrive. We test out our new Ritual Stone buff to conjure Double Flame Atronox and focus fire on the giant scaly airplane. Together, the three of us can deal some real damage. All right. All right, take that. No, wait, <laughs> why is it flying away? No, come back, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of a fight with you. Why are you flying away? Alright, so this might be trickier than I thought. It seems that when we're right on the edge of a dragon's patrol route, its AI can decide to do a little flyby and then go on about its patrol normally. It's a bit of a surprise that it would choose to pass up a fight like that. But do you know what else is a surprise? The fact that over 99% of people watching this video aren't subscribed to the channel. Clearly that 0.6% know what they're doing. All jokes aside though, I'm considering going part-time at my real job so I can focus more on making content. And how many new subscribers this video brings in will be important for making that decision. So if you want me to invest more time into making content like this, subscribing is an excellent and free way of letting me know. Thank you. Now back to your regularly scheduled dragon slaying. We've killed very few of the Whiterun Draugr so far, which is bad because it means they might ambush us during a dragon encounter. We search for them near Riverwood, but still no sign of them. The next morning dawns with an enigmatic fog crawling across the land, but I do have a new idea of how we might lure out the Draugr. We head down to the bridge by Honingbrew Meadery to make sure we're in the dragon's territory, then engage it in open combat. We're not trying to kill it right now, just stall it out. Our goal is to get it to call the Draugr over so that that we can then reposition ourselves on the cliffs by White River Watch and focus on culling their numbers. But after a minute and a half, the Draugr still haven't turned up, so let's just kill this thing here and now. We conjure up two Atronox, then focus on keeping ourselves alive while they launch fireballs at the beast. We lend a little support with our bow, but really it's the Atronox doing most of the work here. Fire and ice clash in a battle of the elements, and as we rush in to land a killing blow, the Atronox do it for us. Honestly, they were the MVPs. With that, we've slain our first dragon and are one step closer to taking back Whiterun. The morning mist resolves into a heavy rain, but it can't dampen our spirits. Since the patrol dragon is no more, we're free to explore the Whiterun tundra without having to worry about aerial attacks. But there's another stop I want to make first. Because so many base game quests are made inaccessible when you remove the NPCs from Skyrim, the Shattered mod makes some changes to reopen locations that would otherwise be closed off. One of these changes is to remove the puzzle door that requires the Golden Claw. So we venture up the mountain to the classic Skyrim starting dungeon, Bleak Falls Barrow. This dungeon isn't especially challenging, so we can skip right to the final chamber. Here, we learn the first word of the unrelenting force shout, then awaken the boss Draugr of 
the dungeon. We conjure up our Atronax and get some distance to lend range support. With the Atronax hurling firebolts and our dual casted flames, we are able to burn his corpse to a crisp without much trouble. But we still don't know where Whiterun's Draugr are. From the defenses of Fort Greymoor, we scan the tundra with no sign of them. Okay, they're uh, all over here, apparently. <laughs> all right, uh, let's bring up the Atronax. Wait, how many of them are there? <laughs> This fight is crazy. We're suddenly overcome by at least a dozen restless Draugr. Our Atronox proved to be amazing zombie killing machines, but it's the archers again who prove to be the real foes, infecting us with brown rot and making us dip into our potion stores to keep from dying. With our Atronox defeated, we take cover behind a stone near Dustman's Cairn, but our only remaining bow breaks and we're at risk of being overwhelmed. So we flee into the Cairn and hope they won't follow us. Okay, oh, nope, nope, they followed us, <laughs> and we're out of here. It's back out into the tundra. We've given up trying to win this fight. We're just hoping some Atronox can hold them off so we can somehow get out of this alive. Oh, of course there's a bear over here, as if we didn't have enough enemies in this fight already. We run east below this drop-off that will slow the Draugr for a bit, and spectacularly, the bear comes to our aid, attacking the Draugr. We expend a soul gem to gain back some charge on our staff, and while sheltering below this cliff, we manage to take out the last few remaining Draugr. I, I think that's all of them. How did we survive that? Now that we've thinned out the regional Draugr, we're just about ready to take back the city of Whiterun itself. We spend the night before the inevitable battle camping at Felglow Keep, pondering what terrible foes we might find within the walls of the once great city. Morning comes, and so does the battle for Whiterun. We're quickly met with some bad news. The Draugr we're dealing with here are Whites, even stronger than Restless Draugr, and our arrows just aren't going to get the job done. We switch back to our summoning strategy, and apparently something we did scared these Draugr because they quickly turn tail and retreat. We get to hose them down with our flamethrower hands while they run. The mass of undead behind Whiterun's walls soon appear on our radar, and we start luring them out of the main entrance, turning the Whiterun gate into an infernal battleground. When we get into the city, we focus on taking out the Draugr around the southern district first and make good progress in doing so. But everything changes when the true foe appears. Oh, Lonva Hair, Bane of White Run. Oh, that is so cool. It's like a boss out of a Zelda game. The first of the Dragon Tyrants is the hardest boss we've fought yet. We shelter under this overhang, which conveniently is made of fireproof wood for protection against their blazing breath. This is definitely an epic foe, but you know what they say, fight fire with fire. Once the Bane of White Run is grounded, our Atronox do a fantastic job of leading the clumsy dragon on a wild goose chase while we pelt them with arrows. And at last, the beast takes its last breath. We're on a roll now. We head up through the ruined market where we face the next major foe, White Run's Dragon Priest. We summon our Atronox, then make the very questionable decision to conjure a bound sword and get up into melee with him. Ow, ouch, ouch, oh, okay, this this was not a good idea. I need to heal. I, I, I can't move, what's going on? I, I, I can't, what? No. I'm still not sure what happened there, but that makes death number two and another 24 hours down the drain. But we're not giving up. We return to Whiterun more determined than ever. This time, we're more careful to stay at range as we take on both the Dragon Priest and the hulking armored Draugr Balgruf, former Jarl of Whiterun. We lure them down into an inferno of our own making with exploding Atronox and jets of searing flame. The streets of Whiterun blaze with the fires of our vengeful fury. Ironic Ironically, the weather turns cold as we burn the dragon priest down to ashes and take his staff of frostbite from him. Then we sweep the streets, returning the remaining Draugr to the grave with assistance from our Atronach friend. On the bridge to Dragon's Reach, we find our third sorcerer's chest of the run and take a look inside. Okay, so we have a circlet, we have the hood, and we have robes. Um, all right, nothing looking too great. Um, I see a spell tome of lightning bolts. This could be good, and uh, a staff of lightning bolts too, okay. We might be able to make some use out of these. With the battle finally won, we survey the ugly aftermath. Whiterun is silent once more, but more importantly, we're one step closer to luring the World Eater out from hiding before he can rain down apocalypse upon the world. But there are many battles still to come, other dragon tyrants still to dethrone, 
and only 38 days remaining. The quest now directs us towards a pit stop of climbing to High Hrothgar, so we head east towards Ivarstead. But on the way, we draw the attention of a terrifying monstrosity, the ancient dragon guarding the lands around Windhelm. We're nowhere near ready to deal with this thing, so we scramble to take shelter within the nearby Fort Amol. Looks like we're gonna be holed up here for a bit. Fortunately, Fort Amol holds a rare treasure, a guaranteed bound bow spellbook. This spell conjures a powerful bow, and since it's magical, we don't have to worry about it breaking. After taking a quick rest, we poke our heads outside again, and it looks like the coast is clear. Onward to High Hrothgar, hopefully with no more nearly deadly interruptions. We arrive at what remains of Iverstead, and while the village may be in ruins, fortunately, the crops are not. We harvest a bunch of wheat, which is a great alchemical ingredient because it can be used in health-restoring potions. We find that the not nearly 7,000 steps up the mountain are guarded by Draugr Whites. At the top of the mountain, we find a surprise sorcerer's chest. I wasn't expecting another so soon. The main thing we pick up here is the Conjure Frost Atronach spell, which fits great into the Conjuration skill set we're building and gives us some protection since Frost Atronachs are pretty tanky. Within High Hrothgar, the Greybeards are nowhere to be seen, but we find runes on the floor that teach us the remaining words of the Unrelenting Force Shout. Out in the yard, we find human remains and a note that confirms what we'd feared. The Greybeards and Partharnax have have fallen to the dragons. Now we're tasked with clearing Riften, Markarth, Windhelm, and Solitude in no specified order. We consider trying to climb to the throat of the world, but are met by a blinding snowstorm and even more powerful Draugr scourges, so we decide it's not worth the risk. Unfortunately, all the beds in High Hrothgar are still marked as owned, so we can't sleep there. Back down the mountain, we go. Oh, okay. Nope, that's that's not good. So, uh, as I was climbing um, down the mountain, I meant to go east, because um, Riften is still a place we need to explore, but I uh, went to the west instead. Um, so we are in Whiterun again. So that's not great. At least we get to spend the night at our old stomping ground of White River Watch. While we rest, we get a pretty important perk, Soul Stealer. This will allow us to fill soul gems from enemies who we kill with our bound bow, so we can then use them to recharge staffs. I had been planning to search the rift next, but since we accidentally ended up back in Whiterun, I decide to give Markarth a try instead. We head west into the Reach. Oh hey, I found a use for gold in Apocalyptic Skyrim. <laughs> we can uh, use it to by the blessing from a shrine. As if that ever is something useful. As we get closer to Markarth, we spot an interesting site atop a cliffside, Sky Haven Temple. Since apocalyptic Skyrim reopens some locations normally locked behind quests, we might even be able to get inside. Just as we'd hoped, the seal blocking the entrance has broken off, so we can freely enter the temple. Sky Haven holds some pretty cool armor, but unfortunately, not much that would be useful for a mage. At least we get a nice view out of it. As we're out scouting for a better base, we stumble into a fight with the local undead, who are highly threatening scourges. They easily take out our Frost Atronach and force us to swim across the river to safety. But killing this many Draugr is too good an opportunity to pass up, so we fight on in the fading evening light. Oh, there are a lot of them. Okay, come on, Atronach, just hold them off. Wait, what is what is hurting me? Uh, no. Ah, what? Did I, did I just die to a mud crab? I, I hadn't slept. I didn't sleep uh, in Markarth at all. So we're in, in White Run again. Oh no. And that's death number three. So that's a big time loss, since we need to make the trek all the way from White Run to Markarth again. Let's fast forward a bit, shall we? This time, when we get to the Reach, we stop at a Forsworn camp for a one-hour rest, so at least we'll respawn here if we die again. We find the empty orc stronghold of Dushnik Yal, which happens to be one of the few locations in the world that still has a working smelter. Not particularly useful for a mage, but good to know for future playthroughs. But then, we're attacked by an elemental dragon, probably even stronger than the Bane of Whiterun. We barely survive a single bout of its fire breath. Fortunately, the mine is still open, so we can duck inside there until the dragon's gone. That was a close call, though. Markarth is really not treating us nicely. We try to head north to where we'll hopefully be out of that dragon's patrol territory, but again, run into a legion of Draugr scourges. Okay, I need to heal. Ooh, go attack them! Don't run away! What are you doing? Ouch! Um, okay, let's get up. 
This is terrible. This is absolutely awful. Okay, apparently these astronauts do not know how to walk down slopes, so let's just get close enough to summon them so that they'll... Ouch! Um... Uh, okay, okay, we're, we're just running, we're just... <sighs> that makes death number four. Around this time, I was wondering if the mod had intended for us to clear a different hold, considering how powerful the enemies are. So I called in a lifeline, asking the mod author on Discord. They confirmed we were meant to go to Riften, so descending down the wrong side of the mountain was a pretty major mistake. Back we go again, into Whiterun, down through Falkreath, and all the way to the Rift. We're relieved to find that the Draugr we're dealing with now are only Whites, much less intimidating than the Scourges of Mark but Riften's patrol dragon is still quite the menace, a blood dragon with fiery breath. We get in some good damage against it with our bound bow, and can even withstand two bursts of flame after taking a fire resistance potion. Several more whites turn up during the fight though, making killing the dragon all the more difficult. Once we can get it on its own, we send out two Frost Atronachs who flank it on either side, and with the dragon outnumbered, we steadily cut down its remaining HP. These Frosty boys are really putting in the work. We find a spot to rest and replenish our food stores at the Fort of Treva's Watch. In the late evening, we discover Fort Greenwall, which could make a good base because of its close proximity to Riften, but it also soon becomes the site of a pretty epic battle. A Draugr patrol party finds us and attempts to scale the walls of the fort. We defend the from the rooftop, bathing them in dual-casted flames and summoning icy Atronac defenders. I'm honestly surprised how well this fight goes. The combo of a Frost Atronach holding the Draugr's attention while we engulf them in fire is quite effective. But even after securing the fort, we're not ready to sleep yet. We instead go exploring and find Fallowstone Cave, which is home to a pair of mighty cave bears. Wait, not a pair. An entire family? Nope, this place is home to nearly a dozen bears. I don't know how this many bears can live in the same cave without killing each other, but now that we're here, they'll all be dead soon anyway. Are there more? <laughs> there are more of them still. <laughs> like, like, surely there's some Animal Protection Act that makes this illegal. <laughs> Our reward for wiping out what must be half the world's bear population is virtually nothing. Oh well, at least we got experience. We find a place to rest for the night at Stendar's Beacon, as we ponder what the next morning will bring us when we attack the city of Riften itself. The day is bright and clear as we make our way to Riften proper, but then we run into, you guessed it, more bears. How many bears can this ecosystem possibly support? They hack through our first Atronach with frightening ease and force us to make a run for it. They're hungry for vengeance for us wiping out all of 20 of their cousins. <laughs> oh no! We respawn back at Stendar's beacon, where it's frigidly cold and have little choice but to crawl back into our bedroll for warmth. That's death number five. Our mission will not be complete until the bears are no more. We approach Riften for real this time, creeping up towards the south gate. We're met by the next dragon tyrant, Salarandin, Bane of Riften. Let's ready a nice poisoned arrow to greet them. Salarandin is a fire dragon, but thanks to our fire resistance potions, we can withstand the heat fairly well. Still, this fight is tricky. Powerful Draugr rush out from the city to attack us, including the newly zombified Jarl Layla. We alternate between focusing our bound arrows on the Draugr and on the dragon as it flies overhead. Our bound bow is is really proving its worth, letting us kill most of the Draugr before they can reach us. When the Bane of Riften finally lands, we attack them with everything we've got. Poisoned arrows, dual cast Atronox, and position ourselves back by their tail to stay out of reach. As we turn it into a big scaly pincushion, the Bane of Riften finally falls. That's two tyrants down, and another city that's ours for the taking. Next comes the massacre at Riften Gate. There are few things we love more than confining a bunch of Draugr to a tight space with our Frost Atronox and then engulfing them in an inferno. This is becoming one of our best tactics. We then creep around to the docks where there are a few Draugr and a Dragon Priest lurking on the outskirts. We have a really close call here trying to slay the Dragon Priest, getting struck twice in quick succession, so we dive into the water to escape harm's way. We resurface and let the Atronox take the aggression this time, safely hanging back until Riften's Dragon Priest is defeated. Finally, it's just Central Riften itself to deal with, which still has quite a few Draugr hanging about. We take advantage of a couple fireball scrolls we came across earlier to deal good splash damage to them, though it melts our own Frost Atronach in the process. 
At last, through prolonged damage and healing strategies, we're able to cut down the remaining Draugr, and the city is ours. Now, we claim our next sorcerer's chest. Let's see what's inside. This chest gives us the next armor spell, Ebony Flesh, so we can keep our defenses up. We also get the Wall of Flame spell, which is expensive, but we'll get some major use out of it later. We depart the Rift, but due to our earlier misadventures in Markarth, we lost a lot of time on this leg of the journey. We stopped to rest for the night in Cracked Tusk Keep in Falkreath, but when we awaken, only 30 days remain. We make it back to the Reach, this time for real, and nap again at the little Forsworn camp so we have a respawn point. Then we have a run-in with some not-so-friendly vampires and a nasty armored thrall. Okay, uh, dude, I really don't have time for you right now. Just, just go away. What? what? You, just, you just, like, one-shot us! How did that even happen? We had plenty of health left. That's death number six. As we travel through the Reach, we again spot our old nemesis, the elemental dragon patrolling the skies. Hopefully this time will be a match for it. We also soon find ourselves a rematch with some of the scourges we had struggled with last time, but now we're adequately equipped to deal with them. As we're exploring the region, we come across the ruins of Karthwaston, which soon becomes the site of perhaps the longest and most intense battle of the entire run. The havoc begins when the elemental dragon swoops down on us from above. At last, we get a chance to re-challenge our old foe. It looks like things are going well at first. Our arrows are dealing good damage, and the dragon gets distracted by a nearby bear. The problem arises when we have it down to about half health, but Karth Waston gets swarmed by Draugr. We try to keep our focus on the dragon, but Archer Fire is reducing our health to dangerous levels. We take an ugly bout of flame breath that very nearly kills us, and must clamber down the hillside while on fire, barely able to see and spamming healing magic. We we do get away, but we brought the dragon's health so low, we don't want to just abandon our best opportunity to kill it. So, we reposition ourselves and hope desperately that it will pursue us. And at last, it does, clambering down the mountain just enough so that we can see its head. With a few well-placed arrows, the elemental dragon has fallen to us. But we're far from done with this fight, because as evening fades to night, the Draugr keep on coming. We battle them on the roads around Karthwaston until the ground is littered with their corpses. Scourge after scourge gets struck through with the arrows loosed from our bound bow. This fight lasts for hours as we grew cold and hungry, finally ending only when the moonlit cliffs of the Reach are at last silent once more. We find shelter for the night at the now soldierless Markarth Stormcloak camp just as dawn begins to crest over the mountains, marking the end of one of the most exhausting nights of our lifetime. We level up and take the Experimenter perk, which will let us learn all effects of an alchemy ingredient by eating it. We spend some time restocking our food and potion stores, then finally make our way to Markarth. As we approach, we invoke the wrath of Yultor, Bane of Markarth. Even after a frost resist potion, Yultor's ice breath takes down about half our HP. Then the fight gets a little weird. After we've taken them down to about a quarter of their max health, Yultor just decides to stop fighting us. Maybe they got tired and needed a little dragon nap time. With them not really doing anything, we can finish the job with a few lightning bolts. Guess the dragon AI bugged out there, but hey, we'll take the easy kill. But the battle just gets weirder from there. We lure out a group of Draugr from the city, and their AI can't seem to find a path to get to us, despite the fact that we're standing just a few steps in front of them on what's barely even an incline. One of them does charge us eventually, so it's clearly not impossible. They just really don't want to walk up this tiny hill. Also, this guy apparently doesn't have a weapon and tries to punch us to death. So the Draugr turn out to not be that much of a threat here. The weather turns freezing cold, but we find our next sorcerer's chest. This one contains a few cool items. The Blizzard spell, which is super powerful, but way too expensive for us to cast right now. The Fast Healing spell, and a Staff of Ice Storms, which lets us do splash damage that our Frost Atronachs will be resistant to. And with that odd, somewhat buggy fight complete, we stumble back to the Stormcloak camp where we can pass out until morning. 25 days remain. For breakfast the next day, we eat a fish that I didn't realize was raw and get food poisoning. Our Magicka and Stamina recover 50% slower? Three whole days? Okay, we, we, we gotta do something about this. So now we need to find a way to cure food poisoning. I don't know if it counts as a disease or not, so I'm unsure whether we can just make a cure disease potion to fix it. Fortunately, I remember a certain shrine we found earlier on our adventures in the Reach. Here, 
we can pay 100 gold to receive the blessing of Debella and cure all our diseases. Which does, as it turns out, include food poisoning. Take that, Sushi. With 24 days remaining, we're a little over halfway to Doomsday, and we've only cleared four out of nine holds. We need to pick up the pace. Next on the agenda is Solitude, and we already spot its patrol dragon as we traverse the northern end of the Reach. As we're having a lovely day picking flowers in the ruins of Dragon Bridge, the beast swoops down upon us, and this one is an elder dragon. Someone had a particularly spicy lunch today, but we know the routine by now. Shoot the dragons with poisoned arrows, use potions and restoration to heal up when needed. We have a close call right at the end of the fight, where we're nearly burned alive while landing the killing blow. But thanks to our new fast healing spell, we're feeling better in no time. Now to deal with the Draugr. They're scourges again, so about as difficult as Markarth's. We find a couple swarms of them, one on the main road and one at Kotla's farm, and fight into the night to cull their numbers. We rest at another vacant military camp and take the super useful Oblivion Stone Perk, which will grant our Frost Atronox extra armor and magic resistance to increase their tankiness. We already cut down quite a few Draugr during the night, so when morning comes, we decide not to delay. Today's the day we liberate Solitude. Like we did in Riften, we decide to take the lesser used side gate up into the city of Solitude. This leads us into a guard tower, connected to this bridge over southern Solitude. But apparently, we're already detected, both by the Draugr and by Broadkrill, bane of Solitude. Broadkrill's not too difficult when they're fighting us up on the bridge here. Our usual bound bow plus poisoned arrow strategy works just fine. The challenge arises when we reduce Broadkrill to low health and they land down in the main city. This bridge has invisible walls that keep you from jumping off it, so we can't actually get a clean shot in. Instead, we return to the gatehouse to make our way down into solitude, but now get charged by the Draugr. We're in a highly confined space, so we can block the passageway with Frost Atronox to buy us some time. These Draugr are really strong though, and they have have us wildly outnumbered. This is when we come up with an interesting strategy with that Wall of Flames tome we picked up back in Riften. By retreating up the staircase and spraying Wall of Flames on the steps, we can make the Draugrs extremely hesitant to pursue us. Then, with a little extra fire poured right down onto them, we can incinerate the waiting Draugr before our protective flame wall expires. It takes a long time to kill them this way, but once we've finally melted all the gatehouse Draugr, we find Broadkrill waiting for us around the corner. Seems like a bad place to attack us from, honestly. We can easily dodge the flame breath by backing up into the tunnel, then strike them dead with our bow. You know the drill by now. With the Dragon Tyrant dead, we then sweep through the city, taking out the Dragon Priest and other Draugr, and don't encounter much issue with clearing solitude. Outside the Blue Palace, we find our next Sorcerer's Chest. This one includes spellbooks for Flame Atronach and Flame Thrall, both of which will let us add Fire Elemental Atronachs to our known arsenal. I love how this build really is becoming a Conjuration-focused mage, rather than a Destruction one, as you might expect would be the norm. And as quickly as that, we've already cleared Solitude in only a couple days. Definitely made up some time. Let's hope we can keep up this pace as we head to Windhelm, which will undoubtedly play host to even tougher challenges. 22 days remain. We invest further into our conjuration powers overnight, taking the elemental potency perk to summon higher level Atronachs. Towards East March once again, we venture, recalling the time that we nearly died to the ancient dragon who attacked us near Fort Amal. With our potent Atronox and improved poisons, hopefully this time we'll be able to strike it down out of the sky. Sure enough, it's not long before it finds us, but with two flame Atronox already summoned, we're ready for it. Each of our potent Atronox attacks does some considerable damage, so much so that we don't really need to do much else. But our Atronox do fall eventually, leaving us to sink a couple bound arrows arrows into its hide to finish the kill. We're really on a roll now. We haven't taken a single death since early in our return to the Reach. Perhaps Windhelm will be easy too. Spoiler alert, it's not. First, we have to deal with the regional Draugr. There's a mass of them just before the bridge to the city that we'll have to cut our way through, but our upgraded flame Atronox make for Draugr melting machines. It's an infernal massacre before us, and the dead don't stand a chance, but the weather does turn frigid as the fight wears on, slowing our movement and reducing our max HP. Cold is going to make for a major setback around Windhelm in the struggles to come. We're struggling with hypothermia by the time the day is won, so we're in no shape to be clearing the city right now. Instead, we head further south to warm up. We make a campfire and warm up with our Atronachs, then find a shack at Witchmist Grove, which can serve as our shelter for the night. 
Okay, we've rested up. Now it's time for Windhelm. First up is Altadon, the bane of Windhelm. But before we can focus fire on them, we're charged by Draugr Herald? Uh, that is not a class of Draugr from the regular Skyrim. Uh, I don't know what to do. Okay, I think our astronaut just exploded. Oh, ow. Okay. And so that's death number seven. Okay, so I might have frozen up a bit there when I saw the name Draugr Herald appear. I definitely could have fought better, but now that we've failed, let's take the time to properly prepare for next time, exploring the region and leveling up a bit. We stop by the Elder Gleam Sanctuary to harvest more alchemy ingredients. We reestablish our base at Fort Amol and get some experience from enchanting practice. Then we clear out a large portion of Mzulft where we can gather lots of soul gems and dwarven oil for alchemy. We venture all the way up the Velothi Mountains to Kagrenzel, but decide it's better not to touch the strange glowing orb surrounded by dead bodies. It's a dark and misty morning when we return to the city of Windhelm for round two. Altadon is the most difficult dragon we've fought yet. There's just something about the angles on the Windhelm Bridge and the dragon's flight path that give us only a few seconds here and there to take clear shots. Plus, the AI is a bit wonky, causing them to drop out of the battle at times and heal back to full HP. Ouch. Okay, well, well that hurt. Oh, they're so strong. Okay. Um, just all the health we can get, I guess. Let's just get back a bit. Okay, well that didn't work. How are we ever going to do this? That makes death number eight. Back out in the world again, we get ambushed by Draugr and barely escape with our lives. But the combination of our Frost Atronox and the Staff of Ice Storms we picked up in Solitude pulls us through. We also raid a Silver Hand base, which is surprisingly still occupied. Guess they were lucky to survive the apocalypse, but not lucky enough to survive our Goat of a Flame Atronach. All right, third time's the charm. I do think we're strong enough to clear Windhelm now, but we'll need to play smarter. We can make use of these covered passageways on the Windhelm Bridge to heal up when injured. There are also tunnels under the bridge, which we can use to pop out in different places to get a better combat position or to hide from our enemies. We're extremely cautious this time to stay under cover when Altadon is unleashing their ice breath, leaving our Atronox to take the hit instead. Turns out, we really just need to stay alive and keep a steady stream of Atronox going. They take the dragon down to about a third health, mostly on their own, and then... All right, we finally... Wait, wait, where are you going? Where is... Where are they going? What? They're just... Fl is that supposed to happen? So that was weird. Looked like Altadon flew off towards Kynes Grove. I'm hoping this is an intended part of the mod leading to an epic showdown, but we see no sign of them when we go to investigate. We warm up and have a snack of 10 cabbages, then it's back to Windhelm. And there is Altadon again with full HP. So I guess that was not supposed to happen. How many times do we have to kill this thing? We reduce them to low health again and watch as they fly south in the same direction, then turn back around. Their compass blip disappears, but I'm just going to assume Altadon is still here somewhere and keep fighting. Sure enough, we find them lurking behind Candlehearth Hall within the city. I really don't know what happened with that flight path there. With a few more bound arrows, we're able to fell the Bane of Windhelm finally, for real this time. The rest of Windhelm is a grueling fight. The Draugr Heralds just have so much HP, but as long as we're careful to make sure our Frost Atronox tank the hits, we can lend ranged support without putting ourselves at risk, and eventually, we push through them. This time, our sorcerer's chest doesn't contain much that's useful to us, aside from potions and a couple pieces of jewelry that might be situationally better than what we're currently wearing. Next, we turn our sights north towards the last three remaining holds, trudging on through the frigid cold. How could the last three holds raise the stakes even higher? After the perilous foes we faced in Windhelm, after taking multiple deaths and traveling around East March to gain experience, we're now down to only 10 days before Alduin's Doomsday. This isn't looking good for us or for Skyrim. But it turns out I was wrong about how the mod works. Winterhold, Dawnstar, and Morthal are actually lower level than Windhelm was. It's not even required that you defeat their bosses before you can challenge Alduin, but per the rules of this challenge, we'll be doing it anyway. The patrolling Draugr we face in Winterhold are merely whites, just our Frost Atronox alone 
alone can probably solo the lot of them. The real boss we're contending with in Winterhold is the cold. I realize that we can't harvest wood for a campfire if there aren't any trees nearby, so we nearly freeze to death before we finally find a tiny stand of pine trees from which we can gather branches. It's nearly three in the morning before we finally get a fire going. In Winterhold, we clear out a mob of Draugr Scourges and their commander, Archmage Savos Arin, now turned Dragon Priest. They've got a lot of bodies, but they're not high enough level to pose much of a challenge. We do find, however, that the College of Winterhold is still intact, including the Archmage's quarters. Since Savos is now a dead Dragon Priest, we happily claim his massive supply of potions and alchemy ingredients for ourselves. Maybe we should have come here earlier in the run. This place is loaded. What better way to celebrate another victory than by eating 15 potatoes? Overnight, we take the Atronach perk, which will give us a 30% chance to absorb incoming spell damage completely. I think Dragon Breath counts as a spell, so this could give us a big leg up in the upcoming showdown against the World Eater. Next, we head to Dawnstar, where the local dragon isn't even leveled. It's just called Dragon. What a little cutie. You shall be burned alive by a flame demon. The Dawnstar Draugr are just whites, so we send in some Atronox, hurl some ice spikes at them, and clear out the city before lunch. Around Morthal, the Draugr are even weaker. They're restless Draugr. Get some sleep, gents. Here, I'll help you. Our sorcerer's chest in Morthal does contain one valuable prize, though. A circlet of peerless magicka. This increases our max magicka by a whopping 70 points, and will be the crowning jewel, so to speak, in our equipment. With all nine holds of Skyrim liberated from the dragon tyrants, and still a week left on the countdown, we return to our old base at Illinalta's Deep to prepare for the final showdown. We've reached level 40 and take our final perk, Elemental Conflux, which gives our bound bow bonus elemental damage when we're near an allied Atronach. Our build this run really did turn out conjuration focused, both in our Atronach summoning and in use of our bound bow. We got Archmage robes from the College of Winterhold and are wearing the circlet that we just acquired in Morthal. Just to show the exact number, 7.46 days remain on our 50 day countdown to Doomsday. We managed to complete the challenge of liberating all nine holds and luring Alduin out before he could devour the world. Now there's just one task left, defeating him once and for all. The final battle against Alduin will take place on the Whiterun Tundra. We approach the final confrontation and can already spot Alduin circling the crisp blue sky above us. You of man and bird, infinitely stained by the stench of an Elder Scroll, you who echoes of Akatosh, to think there are plains where I did not perceive the gaze of such an abomination. I don't know what this Elder Scroll thing he's talking about is, but we're going to take Alduin down. First, he calls forth his loyal dragon priests. They each go down to just a few arrows. Then, we get a round in with Alduin himself, and our flame Atronach tanks two entire ice breaths on its own. What a beast. After that, the other dragons come to Alduin's aid. They're not especially dangerous, but they do fly around the field fast, so it's hard to hit them. This phase of the fight definitely takes the longest, but it does look super cool having all those dragons in the air at once. Then, we get some shots in on Alduin as he rains down meteors upon us. Next, Alduin calls his enthralled ancient heroes to oppose us, and some of them really do pack a punch. We strike them down with flame and arrows, then turn our attention back to Alduin. We get him down to about half health, and it looks like he's flying over to land near those giants over there. Something is still... something is damaging Alduin. <laughs> something is, like, actively... He died! Something- Alduin just died to, to a giant! Oh, that is- that is incredible! That is amazing! Uh, wait- wait, who did I shoot? What did I just shoot? Okay, I shot a giant. Alright, we're, we're- we're getting out of here. And that is- Oh, I can barely even do this. Ah, I'm a YouTuber. That is certainly a way for the run to end. I hope you enjoyed this playthrough. A huge shout out to several modders whose work was instrumental in making this challenge possible. Exit, Veracuco, and of course, Scrabulor, the lead author of Shattered Skyrim. Let me know what your favorite part of this adventure was in the comments. Please remember to like the video if you made it this far, and subscribe to the channel for more. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time.